I'm just trying to give myself the right position. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, okay. You look you look good from any position, upside down, sideways. <laughs> you look good either way, so okay. it's no problem. Okay, let's pray. Father God, and uh, we are so thankful that we can come together here yeah, online from every part of the world. And uh, this is wonderful, Lord, and uh, to be able to just sit down and uh, learn from your word. And uh, since and, uh, this has been the, is going to be the last kind of the lecture, and uh, we are so thankful for your word that so many things that we have learned about the church history, amazing way that your hands of your wonderful works through the, and the man of God all over the world and the places. So Father, and as we have seen, you are great handy works in many nations in the world. We are so thankful and we just want to listen from you that Father, and as we are going to do lots of things and even papers and the, the last final and the study and the, and the give us an understanding and the help us Lord and to just and the, depend on you fully and the, so that everything that we're learning today may bring all the glory back to you. So we ask uh, humbly and the, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and good thoughts and good reminders there from your prayer, just as we're looking at church history and thinking of church history, seeing this, this grand picture, right, of God's guidance and his sovereignty all the way through, that he's in control of every event that happens, which is one of the topics that we're going to talk about today. So um, I will be pulling up some of those questions in just a little bit. And it's in resp response, of course, to the questions that you all have submitted. Um, just a comment before I get going, and I will return to this at the end. But uh, two things, brother, or Dr. Jason Armstrong will be joining us later on. I asked him to come in for just a half hour at the end, or that's what he was able to. I was happy to have him as long as we could. But he'll come in for a half hour at the end and just we'll do some discussion of any questions that are left over right at the end. So I'm looking forward to that and just to give you a heads up on that. Another heads up here is in respect to the administrative side of the class. Um, and it's the recognition that we have a break here. You typically for about a month and a half between each class. And during that break, uh, if you're able to finish out your paper and send that across. So working through for the next month to month and a half, let's say the next six weeks, working out your paper, uh, sending that along will give me the opportunity to read through and give you feedback. And the paper requirements are the same that they've been on the other classes. The reading requirements are the same that they've been on the other classes. I want to encourage you for sure, please, as you do your reading, take advantage of the broad reading. That's what we're really hoping you'll be able to do. Um, reading Justo Gonzalez or one of the other broad sets, even Laderette. I think the first volume of Laderette is available online. I can point you to some of this if you want to get access. If you don't have access to one of those books, I'd love to help make it available or find a way to get it to you. Because uh, we have not in this class done an overarching study of history, walking through church history period by period, telling the whole story. And so unfortunately, if you're not careful, it's fully possible that somebody could finish the class and not have a sense in their mind of the whole story of history. And it's critical to me that you do have that. Okay, so make sure that you're able to take advantage of one of these written resources, reading through, and we have a page requirement for you um, for this course. Make sure that you do that just so that we're sure when you finish the course, you have an overall picture in your mind of the big picture story of history, um, which is something we've not gone into here. Okay, and then um, as far as the upcoming class, in a second I'm going to talk about paper topics, but before I do that, the plan at this point is to do apologetics next. I've started working a little on the topics and the plan of the course, and Lord willing, that would run mid-September through the first part of November. 
So I will get, be getting specific dates to you and specific schedule teachers and details like that as the time goes forward. But apologetics, will be, I think that'll be very engaging. I'm engaged by it, I'm excited by it. Um, and I'm looking forward very much to working together uh, through that with all of us. So anyway, be anticipating, be aware, um, and that's the next step. When we're saying apologetics, I think a lot of apologetics works, unfortunately, are focused on refuting secular materialism, uh, which is kind of the reigning intellectual uh, framework of our day. So atheist secular, secular materialism is what we usually think of as the thing that apologetics addresses. And I don't think that's a full view of apologetics. And that's what I'm wanting to work with uh, through one of our teachers. If you remember Jonathan Threlfall, uh, he did a doctorate in apologetics and worldview, just graduated this year. And working together with him, a vision of apologetics properly stated is answering whatever viewpoint comes to attack Christianity. So that under the broad umbrella of apologetics would be how do I approach an Aryan? How do I approach a Buddhist? These are within the framework of apologetics. So those are some of the topics that we're looking at, a little bit broader than just secular materialism. Um, but I think, I think it'll be a very enjoyable class and something I'm looking forward to benefiting from myself personally. And then um, that brings me to, okay, John Glass, thank you for this comment, finishing both volumes of the story of Christianity by Gonzalez, and highly recommend. Um, I don't know if you have a comment, feel free to drop it in there. The second volume, I feel like, is less helpful than the first. Uh, the first volume, both volumes are just so readable. But as you get into the second volume and other places too, you see that he's, he's pretty ecumenical. Uh, he's pretty open to viewpoints that we find unacceptable. And he wants to see the, kind of the good in everybody. Um, I like Gonzalez. I did, you know, the lecture we had on theological education. That was just lifted out of Gonzalez. I really like his writing. It's excellent. But he is United Methodist, and you see that pop up. So anyway, if you get that in the second volume, if that pops up, um, you'll, you'll get some ideas there and recognize what's going on there. But I think you'll still benefit from it. And the comment here in the chat, I think, is perspective is necessary reading, though. And, and I agree. It's, it's very enjoyable, very engaging reading. I really, I really enjoy reading him. Okay, um, one other thing to talk about here just before I launch into our actual discussion of the questions is to talk about, uh, your, to talk about your paper topics. And some of you have given me a couple, I think just two of you, I got proposed paper topics. But I want to go ahead, if I may, I want to go ahead and put those up for everybody. And the reason I'll do that is just because don't steal these topics. They've given me this topic, so they own these topics. So you can't steal their topics. But I want you to see what good topics look like. And I want to discuss a little bit of the topics so that um, you have some ideas in your mind in case possibly you're kind of struggling to, to have something come together for you so far. Okay, a couple of topics then that were proposed here. Uh, Anabaptists and their doctrine in the light of scripture today. A comment I made here about that topic, as I was corresponding, is the tr struggle you'll have is you've got to you've got to kind of pick a particular brand of Anabaptists uh, because when we say Anabaptists, this is terrible. But let's say something like if you want to say um, Charismatics, you know. I, it kind of depends, sometimes it feels like it depends on the charismatic church you walk into what their actual doctrine is, just because the variety can be so broad. And my sense is that with the Anabaptists, you have some things like that. You, you want to talk about the Anabaptists in Munster and that, that little story that happened there. Um, you know, these people, are, it's, we would recognize that most as a strange cult, just a completely bizarre, twisted kind of doctrine. So you probably have to pick which expression of the Anabaptists that you're talking about. But if you want to talk about the earlier period with the Anabaptists, the Swiss side of it and how that developed it, you could probably pick one of those groups and do pretty well. Um, tracing Paedo-Baptist theology through church history, I think that's a great, great, great topic. Um, I think it could be really hard to get done in a paper. But if, as long as you recognize you're doing a brief survey of Pado baptist thinking and theology, that could be really, really good and really enjoyable to do. 
Persecution and church purity will be hard. What you're going to have to do is you'll have to do something like, you know, three or four vignettes or three or four examples of themes that happened with persecution and church purity. I think if you did that, you could probably get something, but you'd have to pick some examples and then pull some themes out of it. And you could do some things there. Uh, has the modern day church learned the mistakes from the past is really, really broad. And I think you might need to pick something specific out of it, but there could be something interesting. Okay, um, if I remember correctly, these next three topics I got from uh, Brother Zemtan Lian, and these, these could be really interesting, especially because you're there. Uh, Brother David, you could do something similar. Um, they, because of, of your context, how specifically the impact of the work of Adoniram Judson has come to Christianity in, in Myanmar. And, you know, if you made some connections between the history, um, certain things that were important to him or strengths, weaknesses, or let's say, we'll just say uniquenesses of his ministry, and maybe trace some of that down to the contemporary realities that you see on the ground. I mean, that could be very fascinating. Um, you could do, I could see some really interesting stuff if you wanted to talk about, let's say his translation and in his translation, if there are certain choices he made, brother David, you and I had a decision once or a conversation once about how do you translate sin uh, within a Buddhist context and how do you put that into Burmese and the struggle of sin versus suffering and some of these ideas. Okay, well, if you took some of the words that Judson chose and then you wanted to trace out how those translations might impact exegetical thought or the church itself, the life of the church in Myanmar, how that influence has come out. I, I can imagine some really fascinating stuff like that. Challenging, threatening factors for New Testament church in post, the postmodern world. I'm in the middle of reading, um, I should remember the title. Well, give me a second, I'll pull it up. But it's a book by D.A. Carson and it's on um, toleration and it, the uh, intolerance of Somebody help me. Somebody's going to know how this, what this title is. The Intolerance of Tolerance. Um, and he's talking through this. And it's, it's very good. Uh, if I could help you, you know, send a chapter of that along or something, I'd be happy to try to send you some notes from that book. That book could, book could be a good way to break into this topic and to think through those kinds of questions. Carson has some good topics uh, or lectures online about postmodernism. He's thought a lot about postmodernism. And so he could be a good place to start. Uh, the impact of the two century long conflict in Jerusalem to historical theology. And I, th I think what we're talking about there is the city of Jerusalem, literal city of Jerusalem. Um, and so you could do, that could be a really interesting historical theology. If you wanted to do what you're doing is a historical theology by place and tracking as the ebb and flow of even control who controls Jerusalem and then how, um, in our present contemporary context, evangelicalism or going backwards, how do the different generations of believers view Jerusalem and how that fits into their eschatology? I mean, anyway, this could be really interesting. So there's some, there's some really fun stuff that you could do there. Um, all of these topics, all seven here submitted by both of you. Thank you. Uh, really interesting possibilities that you've come up with here. So I find that exciting. Okay, just glancing at the chat here, I want to make sure if there's any other comments or discussions here to put down. Um, I don't, off the top of my head, recall what I gave you in the syllabus, but if you take a look, or I'll pull that up during the break, I believe 20 to 25 pages is correct. So we're looking for a, you know, a good solid double space, but um, a good solid paper. Okay. Um, anyone else have a comment or a question we can go ahead and address those, but if not, I'm going to roll up to the top of the page. And what I've got here for you are the different discussion points that were given to me or the questions that were asked for me. And I tried to do a little work to answer them. Then as Dr. Armstrong comes on, then we can talk to him as well a little bit later on. Okay. And the first topic I had, uh, give me a second to put that up on the screen for us. First topic I had was how did the Presbyterian church evolve? what is its relationship with the terms reformed and the terms Calvinist? So um, that's an interesting question, very interesting question. I did not know this history and should have, but did not. So that's one of the reasons a question or a, a lecture like this is helpful for me because it makes me work through some of these questions. 
Um, and the little bit of research I was able to get done in discussing or thinking through it was that the history of the Presbyterian church as we think of it is primarily through Scotland or Scottish Presbyterianism. Um, so the connection back to Calvin is clear enough. Calvin and, his, and, and the framework, the shape of his thought. Uh, through Geneva, John, Cox, or John, John Knox studies in Geneva, 1505 to 1572 are the years of his life. But he's in Geneva long enough to be influenced by Calvin significantly, returns back to Scotland, and through his significant influence in Scotland, really shapes what becomes the Reformed Church or the expression of the Reformed Church in England and in Scotland especially. So as the history goes forward, what you're seeing a lot of, um, the struggle coming up in 1560, uh, the mostly Presbyterian Church of Scotland, there's just a lot of ebb and flow. Kings later on, English kings, pushing the church towards Episcopal government and pushing the Book of Com Common Prayer. The Covenanters, uh, they take a covenant or they make a promise, they sign a document basically, promising that they will not uh, they will not work with the king. They will not give in to these pressures and these demands. And the, the Book of Common Prayer is, that's kind of the, um, the flashpoint. That's the point of controversy where everything's concentrated. So then the English Civil War, restoration of the monarchy. There's just a lot of back and forth. Who's in charge? Uh, the Scottish Church will back, the Scottish Presbyterian Church will back uh, some kind of revolution during the Civil War, English Civil War against the king. The king comes back, and so they have results. The Glorious Revolution, they're in favor of the Glorious Revolution, 1688, and so that, the result of that kind of their win because they supported the revolution is that they get to have their Presbyterian government back. And so that's the ebb and flow that follows the ebb and flow of English Protestant history uh, in those years, the same expression of the English Reformation. Um, from there, from what I can tell, it spread to North America. And so in the U.S., uh, 1644, Hempstead, New York, and then more organized in 1770, 1717, uh, eventually forming a synod that would become the Presbyan, Presbyterian Church in the United States of America. And then that shakes down over the years into different expressions of Presbyterianism today. So pretty early, though, and it's following the same pattern of Puritanism coming across to North America. It's just an, another expression of that coming across from Scotland. And then probably the Korean church came from, uh, spread from the US, though they now would trace their roots all the way back to John Knox, which is fair enough, even back to John Calvin, fair enough still. Um, but today, uh, the Presbyterian church, very strong in especially South Korea, extremely strong in South Korea. But North America, Taiwan, some expression of it in India, across Africa, um, Bible Presbyterians in Singapore. I don't know. I don't have a lot of. Um, I don't have a lot of interaction with Presbyterians here, but others of you may know, and I'm sure Dr. K could give me some feedback information on that. Um, so, and then one of the answers to the question really ends up coming out as the label Presbyterianism, more or less, is kind of the English slash Scottish expression of what would be the Reformed Church in general. So if you want to search for Reformed Church, if there's a, you can look at a Wikipedia page, other resources that will list for you all the different splinter groups of the Reformed Church. And Reformed becomes the continental expression of it. So German Reformed, and uh, Italian Reformed, French Reformed. You've got all these Reformed churches across the continental side, but um, you know something about once it spreads across the English Channel, then uh, it's going to get changed into a different name. Now, anyway, Presbyterian is just the English slash Scottish expression of how you're talking about the Reformed Church, which is in large part descended then from the influence of Calvin and and through through John Knox particularly. Um, so that's the, that was my best effort at answering that question. Uh, okay, yeah, exactly. Brother Zamdanli, in your comment, Presbyterian, very strong, especially in Mizoram State in India. That's, that's what I was coming across. Uh, certainly not across India, the, the nation, but specifically this state, that there was just a heavy concentration. I think what I read was that in Korea, 
And I think if I remember Taiwan, Presbyterianism is the largest Protestant denomination um, in, in those countries. And then in Mizoram State, the lar one of the largest even denominations at all um, of, within any, any kind of Christian denomination, possibly larger than Catholicism within that one state. So there's little pockets where it's a big deal. Uh, and then other pockets, other places where I, like I said, I, I, I can't think of a time when I came across a Presbyterian church here. I'm sure there are, but I've, I've not come across any. Okay, uh, that was the first question. That was easy enough. Um, as far as the relationship reformed Calvinist, I had this, and you, this is, I'm sure, old information for many of you. Um, when we say Calvinist, Calvinist or Calvinism is so strongly attached to us now to the soteriological viewpoint, and that is mostly attached really to the people that followed Calvin. If you read Calvin himself, much more, I would say, what do you say, more balanced or better to say, more deeply rooted to the text. Uh, if you read Institutes or if you read his commentaries, it's really good. And I would encourage you, if you don't use Calvin's commentaries, grab it. It's free. You can pull it on, up online. A lot of the Bible pro programs have it for free. He just does a great job um, talking you through in a, in a good, responsible, biblically rooted way. So if you've not benefited from them, please do. Um, excellent stuff, as well as the institutes and all the massive influence on the way that we think about uh, so much of doctrine through the institutes. Okay, uh, early theological controversy in the history of the church and how it was resolved. And then what, how do those controversies affect the church in the 21st centuries? 21st century, um, how those things come down. And there's, there's too much, it's, a, it's a, a, such a huge question, there's too much to really get into the specifics of those controversies. Um, I can send some notes or I'll try to put those notes into the box if I remember for some of the early, that early series of controversies, particularly the Trinitarian and Christological heresies and the back and forth through that period. And that's certainly a huge, a huge thing happening in the early controversies in the history of the church. The comments I made here is just the biggest one that comes down to us today. The one that is still with us, obviously, is Arianism. And Arianism, of course, expressed in so many of the cults, Jehovah's Witness, um, here in the Philippines, Iglesia Ni Cristo, so many cults that, that go this direction. It's fascinating to me theologically why this is such a natural hole to fall into. And I think it is because it, it's a little bit easier to rationalize. If you can go the Aryan route, everything lines up nicely for you. You don't have to struggle with the tension of the data. So you're able to put that struggle to rest a bit. But that, um, there's a period in the church when, on the comment of some writers, it almost looked for a period of time like the church at large was going to go Aryan. I mean, there were periods when it looked like the majority view was going to become Arian. Not that we would say this, Dr. Sidwell's lecture, uh, divinely guided illumination, progressive illumination. Not that if that had happened, we would all be sitting here and be Arians. Um, how do you talk about counterfactuals? But not that the church would have just ex been extinguished and, and everything is Arian. I, th I think what we would propose here is that the, the spirit of God working in hearts, most specifically in respect to the text and people studying the text and seeing the realities of the text, there are going to be people that reject the prevailing view the same way that the Reformation in some massive way corrected. So that, but all the way to today, Arianism is still with us. Do we view Arianism today as a direct descendant of Arianism in the early history of the church? In other words, are, do Jehovah's Witnesses exist because of what Arius articulated? And it's true that Arianism coming down through the history, um, I read a book on uh, Genghis Khan. Okay, well, when the Mongols come across, and we're talking now getting up into the 1200s, okay, when the Mongols come across, they're mostly Christian. Christian meaning they believe in Christ, but they're Aryan. So <laughs> you're talking about Genghis Khan and armies coming in and destroying um, pretty vast amounts or raiding pretty vast amounts of European civil civilization. But this is somehow connected going all the way back to Arius. Okay, so there are some historical roots that are legitimately there. 
I want to argue particularly, let's say, with Jehovah's Witnesses or the Iglesia Ni Cristo here in the Philippines, I want to argue that what we're actually looking at, there's a natural human tendency to try to rationalize the data on Christology. And so once you work hard at trying to rationalize the data and pull it together, I think this is just a natural trap that you fall into. I think this has, is a function of the difficulty of the data plus the fallenness of the human mind. And so I don't necessarily see them as historically causally descended as much as just some guy sits down one day and says, hey, this has never made sense to me. I'm going to come up with a solution right here, right now at my kitchen table. And he comes up with this and this becomes another cult, which is, you know, the hundredth cult that's done this. How many people before him have done this? You know, I think that's the way I would view this mostly. Um, side note, comment here. I mean, just direct conversation with uh this is inc iglesia ni cristo taxi driver and he's trying to evangelize me and i'm trying to evangelize him and i explain i talk about our belief on christology and his answer to that is uh i don't know uh, I, I i can't believe that that's hard that's too hard to believe that's it. it's too hard to believe that and i think that that really expresses the essence of what's happening with arianism it's well that doesn't make sense to me uh, in the same way that Islam rejects the Trinity for the same reason. That doesn't make sense to me. Here, we'll come up with a system that works for us. Mariolatry is another thing that I think is a early controversy that probably comes down to us. Um, one of the controversies that resulted in Nestorianism, um, it was the discussion working through uh, how do we understand the natures of Christ and how they relate. One of the issues within Nestorianism was a response to and later his viewpoint is condemned, but I think he was right. He's responding out of concern to the phrase mother of God, Mary, mother of God, which has become at that point an important phrase. Well, so you can see, at least on that point, Mary, mother of God has come all the way down to us now. And we, that's still with us. So there are some points where, um, and, and I'll say this, there are Protestants, there are evangelicals, there are fundamentalists who would actually defend the statement, Mary, mother of God. I strongly disagree, but there are good people that would say this is uh, uh, somehow in their mind, this is a legitimate idea. Um, Mary, mother of God, though, is the early roots of Mariolatry coming down through the Catholic church all the way to the present and Protestant churches into the present. Um, in some cases, people very close to home this still exists. So I would say controversies that happened in the first few centuries of the church, in a few cases, some of those, believe it or not, are still with us, still are there. Um, Brother John Glass, I would love to, go ahead, let's, I, I don't know, you can put it in chat or if you want to open the microphone, but I'd love to hear your comment here. You said so you have some comments or thoughts about uh, the Mary, Mother of God idea. Okay, concept of paradox. Yeah, I, um, I love to use that phrase for my Bible doctrines class. When I hit Christology, I put it up and I ask them, okay, work with this for me. Um, so how do you understand this phrase? Because questions, you can do a really good syllogism here. Is Mary the mother of Jesus? Yes. Okay. Is Jesus God? Yes. All right. So is Mary the mother of God? Well, Mary is the mother of Jesus, who is God. <laughs> but it's perfectly, I can do a nice logical syllogism uh, to demonstrate the logic of this. That's why the, the phrase is with us. Okay. But on the other hand, what you recognize is when you say Mary, mother of God, you have not, you, you've convoluted something, uh, which is there's the Father, there's the Spirit, there's Jesus Christ. So Mary is the mother of Jesus, who is God. But Mary is not the mother of God, because that implies in some way an undifferentiated trinity. And then furthermore, there's just the broader issue of why focus on Mary like that anyway. Um, from a biblical standpoint, once the biblical narrative is done and it's been demonstrated Jesus was born of a woman, Mary is really out of the picture. It's not a focus of the biblical text. So why go that direction? Um, so good. Yeah, the God is born is following that same kind of issue. And I would address it the same way personally. Okay, if there are in, not any other comments, I will keep on going from that, that second topic here. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to skip.
skip and I'm going to go down to some of our harder or more extensive discussions because I want to make sure we get to some of them. So I'm going to skip all the way down here to the history of theological education, that question. Uh, it's a practical application question. The question here, um, what are some things maybe that are happening in our training that either we typically include them in the theological curriculum or, and, and we shouldn't, or we don't include them in the theological curriculum, but we should. Okay, so basically we're asking, are there things missing that we need to add? Are there things that we have that we, we could take out of the curriculum? And then uh, there's a secondary question here down at the end, the last phrase here. Um, part of the question is a need for guidelines to determine something's relationship to the life of the church. So the emphasis in that lecture was do theology for the life of the church. Okay. Well, we've been questioned in the past ministry that uh, Dr. K is involved in and I'm involved in here. Question that in the past for teaching everything we teach, if a guy is just going to plant a church in the province. The reasoning being, uh, you know, he's just going to go out to a place where people aren't going to ask hard theological questions. It's a simple ministry. And so why not give him a year or two and uh, heavy emphasis on the practical side, maybe four hours in class, four hours evangelizing, that's going to get it done hour, or a year or two and let's get him out there. Um, so that question. And let's talk through a couple of, of those discussions, just separating them out. What I did I actually separated out um, the two questions. First, if a guy is just going to plant a church in the province, that idea. And the second question, how can we improve the theological curriculum? Let me go ahead and give us a little bigger size here, and maybe that's going to make our life a little better, or our lives a little better. All right. Um, so starting with that, the question, if a guy was just going to plant a church in the province, um, there are a couple of a couple of un, our underlying questions or subsidiary questions I would put underneath that. And one of the questions really we're asking is how much is too much? In other words, I would assume, I, I know of people like this. I know of people that I was in school with, um, you know, 2000, I know a guy that was in school before I was there. I came in 2000, I was 18 years old in 2000. And he had already been there for a year or two. Well, he's still there. He's still studying. So what, He's, we're going on 20 years of study. Um, and so one of the questions you find yourself asking at some point, how much is too much, right? Do you spend 20 or 30 years doing theological education and not ever enter the ministry? Um, and I, I view something like that as problematic. How much is too much though and how much would we gauge that? Because maybe I think that six years of theological education is great or eight years of theological, somebody else says two years is plenty. How do we even try to biblically quantify this and decide how much time is too much time? Um, a couple of comments that I would put underneath here. We are generally in danger. More often we're in danger of doing too little than too much. Uh, I, you know, I can give you a handful of guys I know that have just endlessly done study and kind of, there's kind of no end to the study. And it's, you think, okay, time for you to go do something. Um, but that's not generally our problem, right? Generally, I know of a lot more guys that jump in too soon. And then after a couple of years, they come back and say, wow, I should have gotten more foundation first. I'm not ready. And now I don't know what to do, right? That's more often the problem. And the case of the guy who just studies endlessly, I think, I think there maybe are some other kind of character or some, some more basic issues going on. So it's not just about too much study. I think probably another issue is at stake. I want to say here, and this is a really important idea to me, let's not, let's make sure we don't sell people in the province. And what we just mean is in rural, rural life, or I don't care in the city. If you want to talk about the average person sitting in a, the average church that we have, let's not sell people short and let's not minimize the complexity of the issue that these ministries face. So something bothers me a little, actually a lot, about an idea um, that, that a person in the province, okay, this person who lives a very simple life, that this person doesn't need complex or doesn't need solid teaching, okay? This person might 
have a lower level of education and so we probably should use some simpler vocabulary in explaining things and so forth. But I don't think that means their pastor honestly ends up being any less prepared or needing to be able to understand scripture. And kind of the vision that is the ideal, the high water mark for me is what, what I'm really hoping students can do is think on a very complex level and then when they actually step in the pulpit, no one knows how complex they work through the text, how complexly or how carefully. They walk into the pulpit and they're not bringing up a bunch of Greek participles and how does this clause relate to that clause. They're not talking through all that stuff, but actually they did do their homework. They actually did it and they just don't bring it up. Um, I'll just give a little, this is just an example or an anecdote, but I, I got the chance, my wife and I, through the graciousness of my coworkers, <laughs> When we first came here, my coworkers gave us a kind of mini sabbatical. And so we left and we went down to the province, uh, Southern Palawan and really well off the track. Um, so well off the track and, and in a, a place pretty far out. And then from there, you could get on a bike, go up into the mountains, cross a couple of rivers, get up into the mountains and you're talking to people that live in a bamboo hut and uh, there's definitely nothing like plumbing or electricity or anything, right? So there's that kind of, that kind of living. Um, and I had an opportunity, a couple of opportunities to minister to them because their pastor was away and I was stepping in for him to cover a couple of weeks for him while he was away. Um, I was talking them through the book of Daniel and talking them through some of the, uh, some of the narratives that are there. And then from those narratives, drawing out theology, okay, what, what I was doing was from careful, actually, translation of the original and then working through exegesis and commentaries. We didn't talk about that. I told them the story. But the way I told them the story was very much shaped by the exegesis, okay? And those people are grabbing, were grabbing onto the story, the power of the story, rooted in the more deeper issues of the exegesis, okay, but they don't even know that the exegesis is happening. And I want to say, I don't ever want to sell someone short just because they have, quote, not as much formal education. They're people made in the image of God. They're smart. They may not know the vocabulary or the concepts. If you throw an idea out there, they may not follow it, but they can think. And they are asking questions that go down to the deepest aspects of, of who we are as human beings, right? And I think that's critical then to give a pastor grounding to handle that. Will a pastor be able to handle some of the questions that are going to come up, even in a rural setting? I want to say Moses, Paul, Jesus, these are the examples we know best of people in scripture that there was a long period of study before they entered into formal ministry, right? As in years, as in decade plus. Well, in each one of those cases, I don't want to say even any of those three people ministered strictly speaking to the upper crust. They ministered to all kinds of people, and particularly Moses, probably Jesus as well, ministering primarily to, quote, lower levels of society, ended up having years of preparation, if we want to put it into that framework. So I think those kinds of guidelines help me think a little bit about how much is too much and so forth. Um, I wanna just comment here as far as the discussion in the chat, just a little passing comment. I agree as far as a person being a professor you know, back at my alma mater, um, that's great. And that's certainly ministry, so no questions there. Actually, what I have in mind is more a person who is a perpetual student um, and they're not really giving back. So they're, they, anyway, it's just kinda, Semester by semester, you take a course here, you take a course there, um, but you're not really teaching or pastoring or you're not really doing anything. You just sort of work a job and take a course. That I'm not, you know, that, that I kind of have some, um, with the vision, okay, eventually I'm gonna get into the ministry, but, but you're, you're thinking, are you really, or is it kind of treading water? I think some of those things can be problematic. Um, and I'll comment here a little bit later on. I do thoroughly agree with lifelong learning. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but we ought, to, we ought to do something too, I think. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, ought to, we, ought to, we ought to minister, we ought to get some things done. 
Um, okay, as far as how much is too much, the closest thing we have would be to, to guidelines would be 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, possibly the qualifications of an overseer, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, or a person who is trustworthy so that he can give instruction and in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So we don't have, obviously in scripture, this many years is how much you should do. But the question becomes, if a man is prepared to do those things. If a man is prepared to teach others, give instruction in sound doctrine, rebu rebuke those who contradict it, okay? If a man cannot yet give a clear biblical answer to Arianism, Catholicism, other world religions that he will likely encounter in his context, I say, I, I feel pretty firm that he's not ready yet. I think that's a, I think that's a fair evaluation. Um, and what I'm imagining here, thinking of with this question, I'm thinking of ordination councils, which I've sat in. Um, and I, so sometimes you're in an ordination council and the guy just nails stuff. And sometimes you sit in an ordination council and you think, well, hopefully he's just nervous. And that's why he's missing some of this stuff. But I've sat in ordination councils where a guy really couldn't answer yet um, Arianism. He couldn't really give a, okay, here are three reasons that we know Jesus is God from scripture. Well, I don't think a guy's ready yet according to some of these qualifications for the ministry. If he can't just, you sh really should just be able to give an answer to Arianism, right? To the, the denial that Jesus is fully God. Same with Catholicism or other world religions. He ought to be able to just pull out of his head from scripture and answer. Okay, until a guy is there yet, I think the theological education process isn't, isn't done yet. If a man cannot yet consistently and dependably exclaim, explain scripture according to its original sense and make legitimate applications to life that span the full range of how believers must live, I would argue he's not yet ready. Okay, now, if we can get that done in two years, great. I would suggest with most people, most normal people, it's going to take us more like four years minimum to get that done. And maybe they're incredibly smart, so maybe they can get it done real fast. But until a guy is able to consistently and dependably explain scripture and make good applications to life, spanning the full range of questions people do face in the real world. If a man cannot yet navigate the thorny ethical and cultural conundrums that he is likely to face in his context, he's not yet ready. And I think, in my mind, these questions, attaching each one of these questions back to the qualifications for the ministry, gives me a firm foundation, a biblical foundation, for saying, chances are, most of the time, we can't get that done in two years of post-secondary education. Most normal humans need three to four years of post-secondary education to be ready to do these things, generally. It's just in general experience. Fitting in with what I said up here earlier, how much is too much, we're generally, generally in more danger of doing too little. I would say if ordination councils represent it, we got to do a little, little more than we typically do. Okay, the question does go deeper though. Um, and the question that we're actually being asked here, let me shut some of these. Uh, the question is going deeper, which is how much ministry effectiveness depends on knowledge, how much of it is experience? how much of it is teaching and how much of it is doing. What I mean by that, or that way of, of saying, is uh, the, the question here, you know, sh maybe our theological education process should be, we give you three or four hours of teaching, but then for three or four hours, let's just go out and hit some doors. Let's just go out and have some conversations. That's possible. The question that I think is a deeper question, how much do you catch ministry preparedness by just going out and doing it? And here, I think two underlying ideas that concern me, uh, beware of dead or unthinking traditionalism. We cannot let our churches exist in a given form because that's just the way they've always been. This is a caution that I wanna come back to later in another question, but um, a concern that's probably with all of us is just it's easier for our church people and for us to just say, well, this is the way it's been done. That's the way I do it. Okay. And while that might get us through a generation or two, we've got to think through on the level of this is what scripture says. And that's what this means in my context today. We've got to be constantly cyclically engaging with the text constantly all the time. 
And so driving a, a student to do that, I think is the foundation of the idea that no, it's not just a two years and get them out there. You've got to be able to teach a student to be able to reciprocally keep on going back to the text, reevaluating, thinking, engaging with the text with each subsequent issue that comes up, not just what, what did we always do. A subsidiary view of Christianity that I think is underlying this maybe is that people getting saved, pray a prayer, that that's kind of the essence of ministry and, or of Christianity. Okay, so that really all that I need to train this guy to do to be able to get the job done, um, I just need him to be able to lead people to the Lord. If he knows the Romans road and if he's enthusiastic, then he's pretty much prepared. See, and I, that's where I'm suggesting the ministry is bigger than just leading people to the Lord. It's discipling people, grappling with the difficult issues of life. And that's going to require more than a year. That's going to require several years of careful study. Um, as far as the question here, uh, elaborating, you know, fundamentalism within the U.S. and the struggles there, I don't, I don't think we, I can go there with the time that we have. I'll just say a concern that you can have if you've ever, um, you ever feel like if you've come, I've visited different churches, just stop in for an evening, and I'm traveling somewhere. And so I, I'm, I stop in and I visit a church for one evening. And the sense of the church is kind of just treading water. This is the way we exist. This is the way we've done it. So next Sunday, what will we do? We'll do what we've done all the years before. Um, they could be okay. But I do think Christianity calls us to be constantly engaging, constantly going back, to put it in the terms of Acts, go back to the word and see if these things are true. Um, and that's, that's the challenge. Any context, any church has got to think every generation, not that we're changing what we believe, but that we ourselves have engaged, <laughs> we ourselves have thought through. And then institutionalism, that's good, the sense that maybe the best way to express Christianity in terms of a, a system or an organization that might look differently within the practical application of a new context. Okay, here's what I really want to talk about more though. Uh, and this is still under this same subsidiary question. The question was how then maybe the curriculum could be strengthened, what things we're doing in the curriculum that we could afford to take out, what things we should add to the curriculum that we aren't. Okay. Um, a couple of qualifications before I get into those. I, I want to say my assumption here, we're not talking about doctoral level training. Okay, so there's a lot of things that we have done here online that I would not recommend as time spent for an undergrad type of uh, training or education. But okay, with that as a qualification and so forth. Um, I'm assuming that we have four to six years to train someone and get them ready to pastor. With that, what I'm assuming is that we're looking at like they're under what's typically undergrad or post-secondary college years, plus a couple of years of grad school, enough to get the guy an MA or an MDiv. Okay, so that's what I'm assuming. Basically, MA to MDiv level is what I would hope that we would go for. What I really think we should do is use the years from 18 to 25. Um, I thought this. <laughs> I thought this when I was 23. I finished my undergrad. I did a master's of arts. I thought, you know, who's going to want a 23-year-old pastor? Nobody wants a 23-year-old pastor. So I could say for the next five years, I'll just sit around and waste my life, wait to get older, and then, you know, wait to get married, have a couple of kids, and then that maybe somebody will want me as their pastor. Or I thought I could use the next couple of years to get some education so that when I am of an age that somebody would actually be interested in having me as a pastor, I'm already prepared. Okay? I think that's what we want to aim for. Probably your average 23 year old's not quite ready yet, even in terms of life and age or in terms of how people view him, good or bad, it's reality. So just use those years, get some education because you're, you're going to be kind of waiting anyway. <laughs> um, and if we use the 18 to 25 years to get basic foundations, undergrad and the last three to four years doing church ministry, academic classes, MDiv type of thing, then that guy is really pretty prepared by the time he hits 25. And then my last recommendation, I think all of us should try to take something, maybe once a year, at least read books, listen to you know, lectures online, but we should all be doing continuing education for the rest of our lives. 
uh, just to keep ourselves constantly engaging and re-engaging. Okay, things I hope that possibly, um, possibly schools around the world would, would add to the theological, theological curriculum. Fundamental to me, I originally wrote exegesis and I changed this, how to understand the Bible. And I, I really think this, um, you do have particularly left-leaning evangelical seminaries, the guy graduates and he doesn't actually know how to understand the Bible, okay? So fundamental, and I put these in priority order, when a guy graduates, he has to be able to handle scripture. That's absolute and non-negotiable. I don't think by this that we don't have that in our curriculum, but I do wonder sometimes, this is back to the traditionalism, institutionalism, do we sometimes substitute in here uh, a Greek class, a Hebrew class, maybe a hermeneutics class, but guys graduate with a degree and they still don't really know how to read or understand their Bible. They still don't really know how to exegete, okay? And I think at the core of theological education, this is, there's nothing more central. Uh, closely related to that biblical theology, the big picture of the biblical story, this biblical theology tends to come on the upper seminary type level. And I don't think any of us would be hurting if we could bring down biblical theology into the undergrad level and already start getting people into this. So the hope being, you would hope by the time somebody graduates from the undergrad level, they can tell you the big story of the Bible, meaning start in Genesis, take me to Revelation. And they get the basic framework, even if all we're talking about is, you know, the flood, Tower of Babel, Abraham, and then from Abraham calling out a people, the Exodus, and then going into the promised land, establishing a king, David, Solomon, the long decline of the monarchy until eventually the Abrahamic warnings are fulfilled in the Babylonian exile, then the restoration, Nehemiah and Ezra, and then waiting until the Messiah comes. The Messiah comes, the disciples, the apostles sent out and the truth spreading to the world all the way through the epistles and taking us into Revelation. Okay, just the basic framework. But I, I am afraid maybe we do get college students that they're not sure if Abraham and Daniel were contemporaries. You know, in their minds, these people are kind of like all in the big wash of back in Bible times. That's a concern. Missions missiology, it's not for everybody. But... If people are going to be dealing with particularly any kind of cross-cultural issue, this I think is, is something that we don't have in our curriculum and it would be good if it was. If people learned how to do some basic analysis, I come to a new issue in a new culture, how do I analyze that issue, right? Um, so, you know, we, we have a food here in the Philippines, a blood stew, okay? Uh, there's a lot of issue with people whether that's a thing that you should do or not do based on the Acts 15 passage, okay? And that can be a very, a very contentious issue. And then you have the issue of a lot of the cults, they reject and say that that's an unacceptable thing to do. So that if we as Baptists agree, then they're putting us in the, okay, that's a complex issue. Putting a missiological grid over that, and I don't, I'm not saying this because I have a particular uh, simple answer for that issue. But having a way to analyze that missiologically, okay, I never encountered that question before I came here. I came here, oh, that's a question. Well, I've got to have a view on that. Okay. And I think that's the mission, missions and missiology question, helping somebody think through difficult things like that. P apologetics, and again, as we'll say in the class, I don't just mean by this answering atheists, I mean answering world religions. And a lot of our students can go out without really knowing what the different world religions mean. Okay, and then last, I'll finish with this and then we'll take a break. Things we could possibly trim out of the curriculum. Um, there's some things here that I'm very embarrassed that I put, so bear with me. Um, some church history. I, this is a church history class and I have enjoyed it. And I think church history is powerful and helpful. Um, I'm thinking more undergrad if an undergrad student understands some basic things about Baptist history, assuming they're Baptists, and if they know kind of the general storyline, I, I can feel mostly okay with that. What I actually mean by this is, if I had to choose, I would rather these things than for them to have 
a lot of time spent in church history. And I hate that because I really, I value church history. But this is the, the struggle I'm having in my mind is, am I willing to do church history and not have them get any apologetics, missions, or biblical theology? See, I would rather have them get these four things if they, if they don't really get a solid grounding in church history, I would rather have them have these four things up here, perfectly honestly. That's my viewpoint. Um, some original language study. And again, this kills me that I'm putting some of these things in here, I'm sorry. This might not see, be so much about the languages themselves, but the way we teach them. I, I am a former Greek teacher and, and teach Greek from time to time here as well. What I care about personally, I care more about a student learning to think linguistically understanding how words work than about his ability to spot parse or translate from the original. In other words, if he, what I'm wondering is if he's 45 in the ministry and he's been out of school for a couple of decades and I throw a participle at him, he probably can't tell me anymore that that's a, a masculine nominative plural. Okay. What I actually, I think I care about more than his ability to nail a parsing at sight. I really care about his ability to understand words and how they work in order to handle the text well. And it is true, Gonzalez says this, and I sort of agree and I sort of don't. It is true that the software makes a difference because a guy can put his mouse through and he can see the parsings. And, it, and truthfully, the guys who are in ministry a couple decades out, they're probably all doing that. Okay, what I care about more is the guy has the ability to understand what's going on in the sentences and the way pieces are put together. Um, okay, some of this is a function of my faith and the diversity of the translations. If you've not read Mark Ward's book, I recommend it. He makes the point that the translations are pretty good, um, and they really are. Uh, we, especially in English, we've got a massive diversity of translations. And if a person can learn to use multiple translations that kind of look through, you can do really well, even without the original languages. So I believe in the original languages. I love the original languages and I enjoy teaching the original languages. It's the struggle that's in my mind, the years that we put in here and then people don't get any of this. That's the stuff that kind of kills me. That's the tension that I have. And then I would say the rest is just because I believe the main thing we're missing is big picture interpretation. By that, I mean biblical theology. I, I think a lot of our students are failing to actually work through um, the big picture of how this idea fits into the whole storyline of scripture. And that I would love to see. Okay, other things that I would be, would be happy to see trimmed out. This one, I don't have any struggle with. I can just say it and I'm not bothered by it. Counseling based in psychology as well as church administration. So the whole counseling, um, the whole framework of counseling has been so deeply impacted by psychology that what we end up with is a lot of uh, discussion. Well, this problem, here's how you deal with that. This problem, here's how you deal with that. I wonder if instead we could get all the same stuff done if we just taught theological foundations. What is the church? I'm talking about church administration here. What is the church? How do you evaluate whether a program is useful or not? How do you practice church discipline? I wonder if we can't get all the same stuff done just there. And I say this because I had church administration classes in my own program, and I would say they're basically worthless for me. What they were taught, what I was taught in them was very culturally specific. It was US specific. It was even time specific. It fit a certain time period. Okay. But what I do from day to day, or, you know, even in, in the year that I pastored, I didn't use anything from any of those courses, except for one thing. I had a teacher who taught us in a practical theology course, how to take a difficult question. He'd give us a difficult question. And then he would have us, okay, go out and collect data on it, collect any biblical information. So we would pull in all the verses and then he would just talk us through. Here's a thorny problem, you know, let's say a person who's considering divorce, but then there's this difficult, con okay, all these convoluted counseling problems. He gives us a scenario, give me verses, we give him verses, and then he talks us through. And in that class, I think what I learned was how to do practical theology. And that's this, we need students to learn how to do practical theology. The process matters more than the specifics. 
Okay, if they can learn how to do the process, then in a new missiological situation or a counseling situation that nobody's ever heard of, they can still get it. They can do this. Not how to set up a Sunday school program, not how to do door to door. I think the question instead is the foundations of theology and practical theology that help them make those decisions. Okay, well, I've said a bunch of controversial stuff. I'm sorry. Let's take a break, and that way everyone can cool down a little bit on all the bad things I said. And then maybe when we come back in a few minutes, then you might give me a hearing. So uh, I've got 9.04. Let's come back at nine minutes after the hour, and then we'll pick up and I'll say some more bad stuff. <laughs> I'll see you in five minutes. Thanks so much. Resume. There we go. Uh, a comment here from Brother John Glass, a question, why are these things that you want to be part of a seminary type course not being taught weekly in the churches? And it seems to me that somehow these should be part of church life. I agree. And I'm, I, I didn't have time, Brother John Glass, to find the clapping hands emoji, but I wanted to. Um, I think that's great. I, I thoroughly agree with that. That was one of the points that Justo and Gonzalez made is let's have a continuum all the way from, you know, let's say my five-year-old, you know, I'm, I'm trying to educate him theologically. What does that mean? I'm trying to talk to him about the Bible. All the way from a five-year-old to a guy who's studying for a PhD, there should be a continuum, a gradual continuum all the way up. And the church can be invited into this, and there's no reason not to. For individual members who have no intentions of, say, going into professional ministry, let them be part of this. Uh, Justo Gonzalez's idea is, why don't we help a scholar, a, a, a person who's a, you know, a kind of a professional teacher, professor type, view yourself as one of your roles is to bring theology in for the average person, okay? And so those types need to get really good at communicating both on a professional level and on a very accessible level. They've got to be able to do that. And so why is theology a thing that belongs to the professionals and we don't make theology a thing available to the church? I believe in that very much. And I'd love to see that kind of thing happen with the church. So um, good, good, good thoughts there. And I'm, I'm hundred percent behind you with that. It's good. Uh, learning to do that and working with that, viewing ourselves as having a role in doing that, bringing in good theology for people. Okay, if there are uh, good spectrum, it's a good good word to put in there. Um, if there are other questions here, pop them in there. Otherwise, I'm going to keep on going to our next question that I want to hit, and I'm going to need to speed myself up a little bit. I think. Give me a second here. Okay, um, the question here that I was asked was, or that we were asked, all of us, are Baptist Protestants? Um, great question. And it was just a comment here as far as do we call ourselves Protestants or how do we view ourselves within that? Uh, a key, and this is good, this Gerald Priest article, I went ahead and pulled that out. I have it as a PDF. It's in the box for this course, which I'll give you the link for. How's that? Um, so you can, read the, you can read this and I would commend it. Uh, it's a great article and I appreciate the recommendation of this question here, the questioner for us to be able to look at it. Okay, so I'm pulling that and uh, let me get that in the chat for you. All right, um, so take a look at that article. He makes the argument in that article that it's really coming down to how we define Protestant. And I took a second here to try to summarize a little bit the article if, in case you don't have a sense, a case, an opportunity to get to it. In a sense, we are Protestant. Historically, we have been quite anti-Catholic. Uh, so in that sense, clearly we're protesting against the Catholic Church. We might be, on this basis, more Protestant than many of the mainline Protestant churches is the argument he makes. I think that's good. We might be more Protestant than, ones, than the ones that normally get called Protestant because we are actually probably more anti-Catholic at this. We are more anti-Catholic at this point than an Anglican church, no question. Historically, in terms of our uh, derivation, we came from Puritanism. So in a sense, Priest says, that makes us Protestants of the Protestants, which is fun the Protestants protesting against the Catholic Church, the separatists or the Puritans, uh, Puritan separatism, our line of that, uh, protesting against the Anglican Church. 
What distinguishes Baptists from their other nonconformist Puritans, Puritans is mainly their refusal to baptize infants, their insistence on separation of church and state. When they left the Puritan movement to venture, venture on their own, they retained much of Puritanism, some of these points. I thought this, this is a quote from him. I thought it was good. In another sense, we are not. Um, we are not quite connected to the Swiss. He's saying this just to make it clear. We're definitely not connected to the Swiss Brethren Anabaptists. And in that sense, we were not around. Baptists were not around when the, um, when the initial, the Reformation happened. Brother John Glass, nice, uh, good one. Contin Continental Baptists are connected to the Anabaptists. Fair enough. Good, good call. Uh, we are part of a broader movement, and that's, actually this relates to what you just said. Free church separatism happened around the same time that was, in contrast to the Reformation, uh, stepping away from kind of a retained state sponsorship. So his conclusion is better to say that Baptists are not an integral part of the Re Protestant Reformation, but that we are, we are in some sense connected in. Okay, this question caught me a little um, off guard or uh, anyway, it was a thing I needed to think through because I have always tended to say that I am Protestant and I view myself, I would say even until today, I view myself that way primarily. Um, what I'm putting here is just kind of a, this is really rough, but it's an attempt. I just took maybe uh, 15 or 20 minutes this afternoon. So, you know, roughly speaking, if I'm breaking everything down, you can say the apostles, but then you can think the early church, Arianism, there's an early split there. Okay, from the early church over time, you're developing out what becomes the Roman Catholic Church. There's the split, the Great Schism, around 1000. Orthodox churches are splitting out. So what I'm talking about is Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, as we know it today. That's, of course, a much later iteration. But the Eastern Church versus the Western Church, that split out. And then we have another split, the Roman Catholic Church versus Protestantism. That split out. And then we could see roughly three categories within Protestantism, Anglicanism reformed, by which I mean descendants of Calvin um, and Lutherans. Within Anglicanism, a response to step away from Anglicanism, so in the form of Puritanism. And underneath that, if we want to say Baptist, Methodism, Presbyterianism, in some sense are coming out of uh, Puritanism. Now, clearly, when I'm doing it this way, John Glass's comment, Continental Baptists, clearly when I'm doing it this way, this is, a, um, this is tracing down through the English Baptist line. And so I'm tracing down to that. But that's primarily the expression of what we mean when we say Baptists today, honestly. Okay, um, that is you know, kind of a, a general overflow, overview flow. Another way that, and this is what I think is in my head when I'm thinking that I'm a Protestant, um, I tend to see broad, broad, broad Christianity in kind of three flavors. Uh, this almost even looks like ice cream, so we can call it flavors. Um, but Protestantism, Lutheran, Reformed, Anglican, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Charismatism, as broadly speaking, Protestantism, Catholic slash Orthodox, the old, old hierarchical type, and then Arian and other splinter, basically cult groups. And so I, I find myself, if I say I'm Protestant, all I mean by that is I'm not one of these other guys. I'm not Arian and I'm not Catholic. Okay, I'm one of, in the roughly that set of groups. That, that group of, of, um, of identities. Okay, so that's, I think, what I mean when I've always thought of myself as Protestant. As far as the big picture of how that works itself out, I think these are the questions that I then end up needing to ask myself whether I'm going to call myself Protestant or not. It becomes a, a linguistic or semantic issue. How do you settle identity? And so you could do it different ways. You could say philosophical, theological. Do we share enough in common with them, with Protestantism in general, that we say we belong in the general category of Protestantism? Historical, did we come from them? What is our derivation? And a sub-question is, does it matter that our group didn't exist at the time? Um, so I, we concede English Bab or Baptist did not, and the expression and our understanding of it did not exist at the time of the Reformation. Does that matter? Because if I'm derived from Puritans who are in some way a response to Anglicanism, which is definitely directly connected to the Reformation, you know, what's the difference? 
Um, these are the bigger questions to, or, well, I'll do one more that's a lesser question, etymology. Do we protest the Catholic Church? So if you want to do Protestant protest, are we protesting the Catholic Church? Or communication, and where I'm headed is, I think this is the real issue. What do people today think when they hear the word Protestant? Um, I'm in, into Ecclesiastes these days. Well, it's the tyranny of the living, right? The dead, they're gone. The tyranny of the living is what matters is what people think it means today. And that's what it is. This is the tyranny of the living. All is vanity. So questions that we could ask. When I look in the mainline reformer, reformers, do I identify myself with them? When I read Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, do I find myself, oh, that's, that's kind of me. I would say I definitely do more than with anyone else that was alive at the time. You know, I mean, if I'm just looking about who was alive at the period, who else do I find myself identifying more with? So at the core of our doctrinal commitments, I am in massive agreement with the reformers. Recognizing though that, let's say this, there, it's not as simple as we think it is. There's a bunch of stuff with the reformers that we think we understand and that's, they weren't. It's more complicated. So as long as I'm willing to concede that point, um, all right. And still arguing in reverse a lot of the ways that I think today, we think today are massively influenced by history. So we are children of, I think, we are children of the Reformation in a huge way. Um, that's one question I could ask. A second question I ask, if I tell someone I'm Protestant, what do they think I mean? I think this is the big question. Um, is the pro word Protestant now a dead etymology. I think it probably is. In other words, until somebody stops and thinks Protestant, where does that come from? Oh, protest. Most people haven't even thought about that and couldn't tell you what, that what you're protesting against. See, so it's basically functionally a dead, dead etymology. So it doesn't, that part of the argument doesn't matter. I would wonder is my use or my rejection of the term connecting me with a broader historical story? and I didn't finish writing here underneath. But part of the thing that I think makes me reserved to say that I'm, I, I don't want to say that I'm not Protestant, the main place I hear that is landmarkism. And so I feel like for me to say, no, no, Baptists are not Protestant, makes me kind of part of that, and I don't want to be part of it in any way. And I think that probably is why um, Dr. Cook emphasized that point a little bit. If I asked what our historical fathers have answered that they were Protestant, I tried to work a little bit on this to try to answer the question. And I think the answer is that I, I can say they would have called themselves Protestant. And you can look underneath here. I'm going to put the notes in the Dropbox. But Cook had a couple of quotes that were taken from Baptist confessions, and they call themselves Protestant. Does that matter? <laughs> That's another question. Does it matter what they thought? Um, they might have called themselves Protestant. Does that mean that we are? You have to, that's a question, further question to ask. And then finally, uh, how do I best communicate with people to know who I am? And again, I think this is where it's all at. I think words are just communicating. Um, so the example I gave here, when I came to the Philippines, uh, if I say I'm Baptist, people might know what Baptist is, but what I get typically from taxi drivers and those conversations and stuff like that, I'll say, so parang born again, are you like born again? And when I first arrived, I said, yeah, born again, right? Because great, born again, I like that phrase. That's, I believe it. And then over time started to realize born again in people's mind, and Pastor Halar says, Dr. K can help me correct me here. But I think born again, in most people's minds, those taxi drivers, they're thinking charismatic. Um, they're thinking also some things like there's some groups within the born again groups that will do street preaching, but they also collect money. Um, and so they see me through that, that I'm a guy who would like stand on a street, street, a street corner and preach, but also collect money for my preaching. I don't want to be that guy. Street preaching, good. Collecting money for it, no good. So I start, you know, kind of qualifying. I am born again, I know, but born again, not what you're thinking. And so I don't use the term. I'm like, I'm a born again, because that's where they put me. Okay? I think that's what we're trying to figure out. So that I could have someone say, are Baptist Protestants? And I might answer, 
one way to that guy and another guy asks me are Baptist Protestants and I answer another way to that guy. Depending on what he thinks he means by these, I might have different answers. So where I am personally, I tend to answer yes. I tend to think of myself as a Protestant, but it might depend on who I was talking to. Any feedback, any comments or uh, corrections or anything here? But what about followers of JC? Help me. Um, I'm, oh, John Calvin, I'm, I'm thinking. Um, so, and uh, if you help me fill out that question a little bit more, Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah. Um, either, uh, yes, yeah, so maybe help me fill out that question a little bit more and I'll try to come back to that. Any other feedback? I'm happy to talk about this particular question, but I probably spilled enough, uh, enough words on it already. Um, okay, let me hit, let's go back up and there, we have some other things if we can get to them, we'll hit them and then brother, or J, Dr. Armstrong's coming on soon, I, I'm trusting, so we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, here, let's talk about, okay, there's a lot we could say here. Uh, oh, but so many others, I'm sorry. We're gonna pick. Um, let's talk about this one. This is Matthew 16, 18. The question is, I'll just summarize the question so you don't have to read the whole thing. The question is, do I have biblical support for the idea that there have always been believers through the history of the church? That's the question and that's the struggle. And a follow-up question here, Dr. Cook's interpretation of Matthew 16, 18 took away in some ways the big support or the easiest support to say there has always been some believer on planet earth all the way from the resurrection of Jesus to now, even in the darkest days of the Catholic church, there has always been a believer. Well, you know, the best support for that is probably Matthew 16, 18. But if we go with Dr. Cook's reading, which is a pretty good reading, then there goes that one. Um, here was a great argument and this is a separate question, but it just, it's going down the same line. In view of Sola Scriptura, uh, what if, if we're saying that, you know, God preserved his people, there always was a believer. What about things like the period of the judges and the kings, where they discover the law? Josiah, you know, we found the law. What? Really? Reading the law and he's weeping. He can't believe this. He's never heard some of this stuff. Okay, so his argument here is, I get the impression that the law was not preached for a period of time. Otherwise, reading of the law would not be a new discovery to Josiah. It's a great point. And the point then is to say, could there be a period of time when actually the truth was more or less just forgotten period temporarily? Okay. Um, so there's some good arguments there. And certainly I can concede that in a certain, let's say a certain place, you could have a certain place on planet Earth, a country where the gospel just gets extinguished. It's not there at all. So the question is, if I know and I recognize an entire region might have no witness of the gospel because it got completely extinguished, is it possible that that could happen on a broader scale or could have happened across the world for, you know, 50 years? There weren't any believers. Is that possible? So here's a little comments, uh, a couple of comments here. To be perfectly honest, to answer the original question, which was, Let's find some biblical support for the assertion that there have always been believers. I'm not coming up with anything. And if someone else comes up with something, put it in the chat or let's talk about it. I really couldn't come up with a verse or an exegetical argument to prove there has always been a true believer at every point in the history of the church. I don't have anything. Um, I can do my best though, and there are a couple of questions I wanna ask here. There's a plausibility question. And by plausibility, what I mean is, to me, it's, it's questionable that in the entire world, there really was not even one person who had true faith. That's a plausibility question because the world is pretty big. And if somebody somewhere just picked up or had some kind of exposure to even a small part of the Bible, then you would think there's a chance somebody somewhere was thinking it, even if it's you know, a monk somewhere. Nobody ever, he never writes, he never talks about it, but he has come to conclusions that basically mirror what Luther is going to do later on. Is that possible? You have things that are very evocative, like John Huss, who's kind of out of nowhere, and he comes to these conclusions, okay, and then he gets killed for it, okay? So you wonder if that kind of thing is not, is it plausible to say there's any period where there's absolutely nobody 
anybody at all who's thought through this. And I would put that together with this question. There's a question of how we define true faith. This got me a little bit into a systematic theology question. I'm thinking through it still. But recalling Abraham's justification, I believe there's stuff going on with Abraham's justification that he's recognizing the coming seed. So he is recognizing the Messiah. We did this way back in biblical theology. I, I believe that his faith is in a coming Messiah. But I wonder if even a person who had just that level of faith, can we identify a person with that level of faith? Jesus is the Messiah, the answer to my sins. Okay. And not me. Is that, has that person come to an understanding that is sufficient? Okay. You've got to ask yourself, this is the systematic theology question I'm struggling with. Does that fulfill the requirements of Romans 10, 9, and 10? Believe that Jesus is risen from the dead and that he is Lord. So you've got some of those questions to answer. But I wonder if we don't have a lot of other concepts we've stacked up together in our assumptions about what is necessary for someone to be considered a believer. And maybe, maybe the requirements we should be thinking, recognizing, you know, if my five-year-old child can come to faith, and I think he has, my five-year-old child can come to faith. There may be somebody out there who has a bunch of messy stuff with Mariolatry and images, and there's a bunch of messy stuff going on in his life because of his background, because he's within the Roman Catholic Church in the year 850. But that seed of faith is basically equivalent to my five-year-old in terms of his understanding. Um, and then one other point here to be made, there is a question of whether the truth had actually completely vaporized in the days of the judges and the kings. So uh, somebody already, somebody beat me to it. Um, as far as the Josiah finding the law, that point, well, you have not, not you know, around in the same ballpark anyway. First Corinth Kings 19, 18, there is still, still the 7,000 who had not bowed to Baal. Okay, so you've got that. Um, that gets quoted in Romans 11. So Paul picks it up and he makes some connections that are interesting. Even within this Josiah passage, faith had not completely vanished. There was a prophetess. And if you look at the era, there were prophets uh, just the chapter before. It talks about prophets who were speaking for God. So there were prophets during this time. And if you want to look at, you can look at a timeline. Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah were ministering at this time. So Josiah found the law and he brings it out. But there were operating prophets. And Isaiah had been alive not long before. In other words, maybe by not doing our chronology, we're not, we're not realizing there's still a lot going on. There are at least these guys that are believers. So I want to say even that example, which is pretty persuasive to me, is a good point. But even the example of Josiah, there still are believers that are alive at the time. They're prophets of God who are alive at the time. Okay, and then one other issue that is there with, if I go the direction of saying, maybe in church history, there were periods where there were no believers. I struggle a little bit, the general teleology, the general flow of salvation history. It just seems it, I think the reason it bothers us is probably valid. It feels something like God's purpose has failed somehow. Well, I think the fact that it bothers us, there's probably something there. So here's the conclusion I'm at. I, I wish I had a verse that gave me some kind of promise. I don't think I do. And I think on that basis, personally, I probably want to kind of back off a little of saying a priori, at every point in the history of the church, there has always been a true church. Um, I guess I have to back off of that. And yet, I'm, I, feel, I feel that it's highly likely that this actually, this assertion is actually true. I just don't have enough clear biblical data for it. Maybe we can put it in the category of some of these difficult issues like, let's say, the death of an unborn child. Do I have um, clear statements that tell me every unborn child goes straight to heaven. I don't, but I have some shadows of pointers that point me enough that we think it's, it's, a very, it's a very good case to be made that an unborn child that perishes will go directly to heaven. I have biblical data for that, though I don't have a strong statement that just slams the case down and finishes it all up for me. Maybe that's where this case is, where this kind of fits. Okay, um, I see 13 
different chat comments that have happened while this is going. So I'm just scanning through and seeing, okay, different uh, questions here. Good. And some good, good, good comments. Um, I won't take time with them now, but some good comments here to recognize. I thought I discussed, maybe I discussed somewhere else. Well, I know where I discussed in another question, the possibility within apostate groups, the Catholic Church and so forth, the reality that there can be believers. And that's a point that we'll discuss if we can get to it later on. Okay, uh, any other comment or anything that we need to talk about here? Um, another piece I could put in here, uh, Dr. K, you've beat me to this, good. Um, you go back even to the patriarchal era, pre-patriarchal era, you've got some incredible things going on with Melchizedek. Who, who is this guy? Um, and you've got some, you know, a whole community of God believers somehow. You've got some incredible things like that happening that just make you think that we, even across church history, it's, it's very likely that you've got this kind of thing still going on. Okay, um, I'll jump up then just for sake of time and let's hit, uh, let's hit this question. Or, I'm sorry, I'm trying to decide. Yeah, okay, I'm going to choose this question instead. We'll call it... Uh, We'll just do it. Um, so the question here is providentialism, or how much do we see God's providence in history? Uh, thorny, and that's kind of what I want to go here, just a thorny question. Is, is it historical fact uh, pointing to a specific instance, can we say, this resulted from that cause? Doesn't God's sovereignty enable us to say that God did allow or even choose that this specific thing would happen? This is the struggle that Dr. Matsko gave us one side, Dr. Sidwell giving us a slightly different side. It's that struggle and it's back, thinking through that. Um, a couple of things that come to mind, can we establish causation? Can we establish any causation? I'm being a little bit um, skeptical here, but I, if you've ever come across David Hume's argument on causation, this is in philosophy, blistering. It blows causation to pieces. Um, basically more or less, causation is just a shorthand, but there's no way to prove that anything caused anything else. It's very skeptical, okay? Within history, we probably have something like, what caused the Great Depression? What caused World War II? What caused the Mongol invasion? A bunch of stuff, you know, so that we have that problem. Um, another problem that I have that I struggle with this issue, how to, you know, recognizing God's providence in history or not, any answers I give are subject to counterexamples, and that's going to be ticklish. So Dr. or David Woodworth gave a great example. I can do the Spanish Armada, but what about the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre? Spanish Armada, God gave victory to protect Protestantism in England. That's nice, but what, where, was, where was God in protecting Protestantism in France? Well, he allowed the Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and he allowed the revocation of the Edict of Nantes that basically killed Protestantism in France. So if I see, Protest or if I see Providence in the Spanish Armada, I've got to have an answer for when it doesn't go our way, basically. And that gets tricky. Um, I also have this, Job's friends illustrating over theologizing or interpreting events. In other words, Job's friends saying, this happened to you because you did this. This because of this. And I can't do that, I don't think, personally. I can't look at a person and say, you have a trial because you sinned. I can't do that historically either. Um, even in divinely recognized instances, the moral and theological realities are complex. So God tells me biblically, I know Babylon conquered Israel because of their sin. I know that. Biblically, providence, no question. But then you realize, because later on you get this, uh, to Babylon, well, don't think that you would accomplish this because I'm going to later use someone else to punish you. And you realize it's not that in Israel is bad and Babylon is good. It's, God can use this person to accomplish that and that person to accomplish that and that. See, and it gets really complex. We can definitely say, and here I'm going more theological, we can definitely say that God always stands behind events. Every event. Okay, if I you know, if my internet connection drops later on and I lose the connection, we know providentially that was God's providence because God is in control of everything. So we know that a priori. The trick is knowing what each event means. 
In other words, I know that every event happens, God providentially allowed my internet connection to drop, but was it because I was about to say something bad? Because if that's true, why didn't my internet drop an hour and a half ago before I said all those other bad things? So we end up with this struggle and the issue becomes when I look at a specific event and I say, this happened because of that, that's where it gets messy because I think the truth is I just don't know. There's a little stream here that's very interesting. I wish I could talk about this more. Um, Augustine, the city of God, if you know the history of that, he's answering apologetically to say, no, Rome did not fall because we gave up our gods. This is a story I'm in right now. It's a very fun book. And if you're interested, I can give you the title. Uh, Prisoner in, what is it? Well, I'll pull it later. Um, but okay, it's, it's during the time, late 1800s, when the Pope, Pope Pius IX, is declaring papal infallibility. It's an incredible story. If I had another 30 minutes, I'd tell you this story. It's fabulous. It's crazy. It's unbelievable. And the political complexity of what was going on in this. It's a, just a fun read. I'm having a great time. And what happens is he calls in all the bishops and the cardinals to come in and they're going to vote for papal infallibility. The day they're coming in, it's Rome. It's hot. And they get this huge thunderstorm, crashing thunderstorm. And all the, the cardinals and the bishops are soaking wet, walking into St. Peter's in order to do this. And they all go in and every cardinal and every bishop has to kiss. I think it's the cardinals can kiss his, kiss his ring and the bishops can kiss his knee. And the next level, the priest can kiss his toe or something. It's absurd. Anyway, everybody has to line up and do this on their way in. And they're all soaking wet in Rome in summer. It's terrible. It's a fiasco. And they spend the next six months arguing and debating about this thing. And at the end of six months, they finally bring it to a vote. They're going to vote for papal infallibility. It's a just disaster. And the day they're going to come in and have this vote, there's another crazy thunderstorm and everybody gets soaked again. Okay. And after the vote happens, and they did, of course, agree papal infallibility. After the vote happens, they come around and there's a big conversation and they're saying to the Pope, what if this represents that God is not in favor of papal infallibility because we had a thunderstorm on day one and a thunderstorm on the last day. And so maybe that proves that God is not in favor of us doing this. And the Pope's answer is, well, don't you remember that when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, there were thunderstorms and lightnings and earthquakes then too? So this shows actually the glory of God that he sent these thunderstorms on these days. <laughs> you just think, you guys are all wrong. You guys are all out of your heads. Okay? It, was, it was two thunderstorms and it was a mess. And then after this happens, there's a war that breaks out between France and Prussia. France pulls their troops out of Rome France folds and Prussia destroys them. And the French are coming to their, their officials and saying, or their soldiers are coming in and saying, God is judging us because we let the Pope get conquered. Because we let the Pope down, that's why France just folded. So anyway, what this is telling me is there's a history of people looking at an event and assuming, well, this is because of that. See, and I, I think that's disaster. I think it's probably a bad idea. Uh, it's just a bad idea all across. Here's what I can do theologically. I know that God's providence is total. So I can definitively a priori say if something happened, it happened in God's providence, right? I mean, if it happened, that was God's providence. That, that's a priori. It's just before I even have the discussion in terms of my, at least my theology or my viewpoint, this is my worldview. Everything that happens is within God's providence. Theologically, we probably have to divide this out, or we do have to divide this out. Everything that happens that's good, nobody gets to claim credit for that. That's God's, right? On the other hand, anything that happens that's in the category of sin, God allowed it. So we do that standard. That's a standard distinction that we make across systematic theology. The problem here is trying to identify what is good and what's not, right? Was World War II good or bad? We, I think, we're going to universally say it was bad, it was disaster, it was horrible, people died, it was a mess. But one of the results of that is it opened up Japan for the gospel, and some people got saved. You know, I don't know. Anyway, I don't know, you don't know how to pen what is, you see what I mean? I don't know how to pen what is good, the thing, everything's so mixed.
It's so complicated. We probably should not separate between the natural storyline of historical causes and God's agency. God works within the nuts and bolts of history and normal people. And to explain what I mean by this, I'm going to make the comparison to miracles. So when I, when I recognize something as a miracle, I think the underlying assumption of that probably it's a miracle because it was something so unusual. Right? I don't normally walk outside, there's lightning, and I say, miracle, lightning. What I, I see as lightning is, well, you know, the clouds and static electricity and build up and zoom, it equalized. Okay, so I don't regard that as a miracle. I think what I regard as a miracle is if something happened that was completely out of the ordinary, the normal physics and so forth. I think maybe history is working a bit like that, where the normal nuts and bolts of this arrogant ruler and that, that economy that fell apart and the concerns of this group, all of those things came together and out popped a result, an outcome. And I look at that outcome and I ask, well, was that God's providence or was it those guys? And the answer is, yeah, it was those guys and God's providence. It was the clouds building up static electricity and then lightning. Who gave the lightning? God, but he did it through the clouds and the static electricity. And I think that's probably the category we put here. So that I think when we're asking a question, what is providence in history? I think maybe what we're actually asking is, is there something that happened out of the ordinary? And we say, that was so weird, that has to be providence. And that's where I don't trust myself to be the judge. <laughs> I don't really trust myself to say, um, you know, the Spanish Armada was an extraordinary event. It might have just been a bad, it was a storm. God caused the storm and God had purposes. But then if I do that argument, I have to do that for the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. All that stuff is true. In the nuts and bolts of history, God is in control of everything. And the people that are doing this are part of the factor. And it's all, all actually one big thing. All right. I'm going to pause. I've got lots of chat and then more significant to me. Yeah, good. Brother Kenneth, we need to be careful not to become one of Job's friends. It's fair. It's good. Um, more significantly, brother Dr. Armstrong is on here. I saw you pop in. So Dr. Armstrong, I've been chatting and running my mouth here. Let's, um, can we hear from you? Are you, I don't know if you're hearing us there or not, but if you are, I'd love to get your feedback or thoughts here. Maybe not just yet. Okay, we'll wait. Anyone else have a, um, a comment or a thought here? And then we'll just see as Dr. Armstrong is able to come in. We'll look forward to hearing from him. Anyone? Comment, thought? Okay. Dr. Armstrong, are you there now? Happy to hear from you if you are. Um, let me do this. I'll take also the, uh, I'll take this outline and I'll also put that up for you in the Dropbox folder. So if you want to read through any of this content, I'll have that up there for you. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm going to unmute Dr. Armstrong and see what happens. Are you there? Maybe not just yet. Nothing yet. Hello? Okay. He vanished. So I think we'll pause there and come back to it if we can. Well, then while he's waiting, um, and if anyone else has another question to do, I'll take that or otherwise I'm going to keep on going. Um, maybe I'll summarize or kind of put a cap around what I just said here. Uh, one of my recurring, Dr. Armstrong, you there? Oh, we're still not hearing you. Sorry. Yeah, we still don't have anything there. One of my, there we go. We hear you. Welcome. Uh, did you, uh, anything that came up, I was just talking through a providentialism discussion, anything that came up there that was engaging to you or anything that you would want to add to a discussion of, you know, if I'm looking at something and regarding it as this was a providential act of God or God was doing this here, God was doing that there or anything, just a question of providentialism. I actually didn't hear uh, most of the uh, most of the class, but one one thing that I would note on that is to accept both the bad and the e and 
both what f- we think furthers the cause of Christ and what we think doesn't further the cause of Christ, understanding that really everything furthers the cause of Christ, <laughs> that uh, everything, God is working everything out uh, for good. Um, instead of saying just the things that are good or that we see as good are, are God's work. Um, I would probably see it more that way rather than saying, well, we can't say anything is God's work because there's good and there's bad. Um, I'd, I'd want to see God's, um, of course, with the, the, the terms here are tricky too, right? Providence means actually that he sees, he sees, he sees in advance of what, what's happening. Um, he sees ahead of time. Uh, if you want to talk about sovereignty, sovereignty, I see that as God's rule. Um, I think the word control has been so uh, polemicized, uh, has been so debated uh, that I think God's rule can be, can be helpful. I mean, God is ruling everything. Um, he's the king overall in every aspect of, of history. What appears to be good, what appears to be bad um, uh, through all that. So I'd, I'd probably go, I'd probably just mention that, but I, I really didn't hear a lot of the, um, yeah. do you have any That's questions good. for me from the, I actually really. do. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I do. I have something I want to throw at you here. Um, and it was a discussion we've already done and I'm just, so I'm going to go ahead and just get your input working with this. So one of the questions that came up and this was through, um, I'm putting it up on the screen so you can see it as well here. This was through Dr. Cooks uh, and Dr. Sidwell. They both talked about this. The question of they're always believing, being believers throughout the history of the church. And, you know, the point being there's places where I can't actually point to where the church is, but I want to believe that there is a church somewhere. The problem we had is we're not coming up with any biblical support for it. <laughs> so, I, you know, I mean, working with Matthew 16, 18, I don't know that that exegetically holds up. Um, would you say a priori or as a principle, you believe that there have always been true believers in the history of the church? Do you have a way that you would support that exegetically? Anything. I, I'd love to get some, some help on that. Great. That, that's actually a question that I'm very glad you asked. Um, I would actually agree with Dr. Sidwell. For me, the exegesis um, is it almost seems irreverent to say irrelevant. Thank you. Um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily base my case on Matthew 16, 18. I think that there could be good interpretive arguments for that. Um, I wouldn't base my case on that. What I would say is that um, in the book, The Insanity of God, will kind of, we'll kind of help with this in giving uh, anecdotal uh, evidence for this. Uh, but I think that something that we often don't understand in our, in our circles, in our conservative evangelical fundamentalistic circles, is that we are very narrow in what we understand as a church. Um, as you go through history, you realize that the uh, corruption of the church during Luther's time was not necessarily like that in every place and time since the apostles died. But does that make sense? And so totally. what, what I teach is that wherever the word of God is, the true church is. Does that make sense? So I see Matthew 16, 18 being fulfilled in the preservation of God's word. And when we see that, we see that in, in church history. And that's where I think that the trail of blood actually has some um, I think that the groups they select are the wrong ones, <laughs> but I think that they have some good, um, some good basis of, of, of what they're saying in that instead of wherever there's blood, there's a true church. Um, because some of these groups we could just say are, are, are criminal you know, <laughs> in the sense of heretical. Um, but wherever God's word is, the true church is. And we really do see this. We see this even with... Um, in the 11, 1200s with um, the, his name always escapes me. Uh, Leon, the um, lion, the poor man of lion. Um, this very rich guy, uh, you may, if you remember his name, tell me. Um, 
Uh, it's very rich. Go guy. ahead. I know what you're talking about, and I'll find him yes. in Google search. Yes. You go ahead. <laughs> this very rich guy in Lyon, France. Now, France is like pioneer land. It's like way out in where there's no culture. There's no. This is before you know Paris and all this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, this is this is no man's land in the United States out west. Um, Peter Waldo. And he comes to his priest and he asks, what do I need to do to inherit the eternal life? And his priest quotes to him the scripture. He quotes him Jesus' words, we'll sell everything, follow Jesus. And so he actually does that. And, and one of his first things that he does is he sells everything. Uh, he provides enough for his family to be supported. And then he pays somebody to translate the scriptures and then goes around preaching the scriptures in the native tongue. And we're talking about the 11, 1200s here. Early, late, late 1100s, early 1200s. Um, and what we see then is that these guys, four or 500 years later with the Reformation, they actually joined with the Reformers because even though he didn't have a lot of developed theology back then, he had God's word. And we see that through persecution and all of this stuff, they come to the Reformation and they're like, yeah, that's what we've been teaching. The, uh, no, not the Lollards, the uh, poor men of lions. Are you talking about Peter um, Waldo? Yes, the Valdensens. Thank you. The Valdensens, Peter Waldo. Um, thank you. And, and the Valdensens. Um, so this is, this is another example. Uh, another example, of course, is Wycliffe. We have to remember that Wycliffe is happening in um, England uh, about 150 years before this is, this is like 50 years before John Huss. So we're talking about 150 years before Martin Luther. He is a Roman Catholic. And yet, he is the most revered, most erudite doctor, which means teacher of theology in England. One of the most revered in the entire Western world. And what does he do? He begins, in the study of scripture, he begins to correct the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. He begins to translate the scriptures and teach the scriptures in their tongue, sends out people like that. And he is, um, they are severely persecuted. And th that those are, I believe, the, the Lollards, uh, followers of uh, John Wycliffe. What they have is God's word in their language, and they're going out and, and preaching it. Then John Huss in, in Prague, we're talking now the Czech Republic, same thing. He's preaching, he is the, um, the pastor of the most important church in the capital city of his country. He's also the rector of the state university there. And he starts preaching the word in the language of the people. And that's of course why he's called and then he's burned as a heretic. Um, but I think what we should see here is that these are examples. Remember history is not complete. These are examples of what God's doing. God has left us, if we wanna say a trail of blood, He's, he's left us enough lights to be able to see where God's word is, God is working. Um, that can be in the Catholic church, that can be in the Orthodox church. Um, there is actually a Russian Orthodox patriarch during the time of the Reformation who um, composes a reformed confession. So he's one of the most, and you have to remember Martin Luther was not, you like, we like to think of him as a monk. He wasn't just some like, crazy little monk hiding out somewhere. This guy's a doctor of the church. This means he was trained and is the, an official teacher of theology for the Roman Catholic Church. He, he's not some nobody. He's one of the rising stars of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so we, we, we have to remember that these guys in, in the Reformation, a lot of these guys, Zwingli, the same thing. Zwingli is the pastor of the church in Zurich. This is the most important canton in Switzerland. And he is the guy in Switzerland. And what is he doing? He, he's bringing about a reformation. Um, so we, we have to realize that our, our thinking of God only working in certain areas is just not true. Wherever God's word is and people are reading God's word, people are coming to the light. And so God has preserved his church by preserving his word. How do we know that we are true believers? It's not because somebody passed it down to us who passed it down, who passed it down, who passed it down. No, because we can match it up against the inspired apostolic writings of God's word 
and say, yes, we are an apostolic church. How do we know? Because we have God's word. That's our authority. That's our authority. And so for this question, I would very much, uh, instead of going to like a, a verse necessarily, I would just say uh, theologically, and you can go through all, all scripture here, where God's word is, there you have the true church. Uh, you say, well, what about the Catholic church like preserving God's word? Well, that's, think of the Pharisees. The Pharisees memorized large portions, sometimes, you know, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Um, they meticulously, these scribes who opposed Jesus, meticulously uh, preserved God's word for us. And God used the Roman Catholic Church in a very similar way to preserve God's, God's word in an amazing way where these monks were often literally giving their lives, uh, both spending their lives and being martyred for copying God's word. Um, so we, we have to realize that God was actually using them to preserve his word. And because the word was preserved, it actually had a, a reformative, if you want to say that, um, effect even against the false doctrine of those who were preserving his word, like the Pharisees. That's great. Good, 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 good. Um, all right, Dr. Armstrong, we're going to hit you with one more question, and I mean, this is going to take us out for the entire course, so this is it. Hit, hit us a home run for the very last thing we're going to do for this course. Now, um, just give us a pointer here. So we've enjoyed learning about historical theology. We've all grown. Um, how would you say, if you're going to give someone a pointer to keep on growing in their knowledge of historical theology, what are some of the things we ought to be doing? Uh, some pointers to develop in good exercise of good exercises of historiography and good knowledge of the discipline. I would say that there is um, one of the foremost marks of a good historian is what uh, Dr. Beal really just um, made a big deal. Uh, he was my uh, primary church history teacher as well as Dr. Cook, who was another one of the, the teachers for this class. Um, is the word honesty. We are so reticent to be honest about our enemies. If we can be honest about what they actually believed. Um, so when we sit down with the Roman Catholic, instead of telling him what he believes and he's denying that he believes that, we should be able to state in our words what he believes and he should be able to agree with us. Um, if we can actually be honest, both with history and with the people that, that, we're, that we minister with who have different perspectives than we do, if we can be honest with that, where they actually agree with us that that's what they believe, um, that's the mark of a true historian. And it's, it's difficult. It means you have to enter their world. It means sometimes you have to understand that they define terms differently. Um, a very controversial figure here that illustrates this is N.T. Wright. We've talked a little bit about that. And um, one of the things that people often say about him is those who criticize him and then those who support him, instead of saying, instead of arguing against those who criticize him, most people who support him say the people who are criticizing him don't understand what he's saying. That's the major, major critique. A lot of that is because as he is actually a historian. Um, he's a theologian, but his training is in, is in history. And so he sees things from more of a historical angle. And um, it seems that often it's very difficult for pastors and theologians to really enter into the world of somebody who is so different than themselves. Um, and that would probably be the main, the main thing. Try to understand, not instead of the first question being what's wrong with this or what's right with this, or is it wrong or is it right? There's a previous question we need to do. Uh, and often we come in saying, okay, what's right with this? What's wrong with this? This doesn't seem right. What's wrong? Before hitting that step, and that's a necessary step, but it's not the first step. The first step is what is he saying and why is he saying it? What is he saying and why is he saying it? Then you can go to is it right or is it wrong? Um, and then the right and wrong becomes very nuanced as we saw in the, in, the, in the church fathers, where sometimes the problem is not the answer we're giving, the problem is the question. Um, so really being able, trying to be um, honest and seeing both 
the, um, the good points and the bad points of both our enemies and our friends. And if we're able to try to be as objective as possible, that's very difficult, but as objective as possible in reading history, we'll be able to learn more from that and really open our minds. Um, that's one of the major uh, byproducts, major um, benefits of studying history. It's great, really good. One of the things that's hitting my mind is when you're describing some of this, uh, that maybe some of these concerns map similarly between history or church history, historiography, and missiology. That in the mm. same way, if I come in with a preset, yes. this is the way it works and that's the only way it works, I hit another culture, they bring different questions to me and different configurations of things, and I drive it through with just my own viewpoint. I mess a lot of stuff up culturally. Well, so history is just that across time, right? You're just tra traveling to cultures across time. And you are traveling to cultures. Martin Luther was not a Filipino or an American or Polish. He was, he was German. So we, we do have to realize that we're in different cultures. We're in different churches. Um, one of my pet peeves with that is with like the whole Council of Dort we take that as Calvinistic theology, um, as if Calvin's main opponent was somebody who lived 50 years after he died, namely um, Arminius. Calvin never wrote a single word against or for Arminius because Arminius started writing 50 years after Calvin died. Calvin was fighting the Roman Catholic Church. So, that, that just throws a whole different light on what we consider Calvinism and the arguments that he was interacting with. Um, so just, just, just an, a historical example of something that's very contentious today and um, evangelical circles. But yes, it is very close. To, it is missiology basically across time because you are in different cultures with different churches with different questions, different that's languages. Good. That's great. All right, we got to wrap it up. Uh, Dr. Armstrong, thanks again. This is good. I, I asked you for a home run, you gave it. Uh, thank you very much. We're looking forward to apologetics, and I will be back Great. in touch with all of you to let us know what's going on. So thank you. Thank you for all of you that have tuned in and your time and your interest in church history. And Dr. Armstrong, thank you for contributing multiple different lectures here. Very much appreciative praising the Lord for each one of you that have had so, Thank you all. Have a great day or night, and we will be back in contact in the next day.